Coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52, right next to Area 51, where nobody can find us here at 1233 American Legion Drive, Festus, Missouri. This is Pastor Mike, and I'm online, and I am live with you today. Absolutely, the, in, in my mind, the greatest fusion of scripture and music that exists on planet Earth today, I am reasonably sure that the music in heaven is far greater than anything that we have down here, including rap. Anyway, without, without, it, without a doubt in my mind, um, Handel's Messiah, the greatest fusion of scripture and music that has ever been created on planet Earth. Um, the music is timeless. Uh, some people mistakenly call that opera. It's about as much opera as Grandpa Jones and his wife playing the handbells. All right? I mean, that's there, it's not opera. It is an oratorio set to music. Um, Handel was commissioned to do this. He sat down with a Bible, and he used scripture verses, and he put them to music. And some of it is uh, there. If, if you've never listened to the entirety of Handel's Messiah, it's quite long. Um, I think you can get it on two CDs. If you want, I mean, it's it's huge. Um, but some of it is solo singing. Uh, some of it is the, the choruses together and so on. I like it. I like it. Now, I can't say that every song in there is my favorite. Hallelujah Chorus is one. Uh, he Shall Feed His Flock is another. That's beautiful, beautiful melody. Um, and it just kind of brings to music those great verses out of the scriptures that you and I are, are familiar with. You, you just can't help but feel elated, especially with the Hallelujah Chorus. And as I said the other day, the King of England, upon hearing this for the first time, he's hearing the Hallelujah Chorus. And the Hallelujah Chorus is not at the beginning or at the end of the entirety of Handel's Messiah. I think it's like two-thirds of the way in or something like that. But when they started singing hallelujah, and he just felt so elated, he stood. And, of course, you know, when the king stands, all the king's men are going, <clears throat> and they stood. Then when all the king's horses and all the king's men stood, then everybody else stood. And they asked him, they said, why did you stand, you know, during this? And... He said uh, something to the fact that um, he had an endorsement from Norelco, and they t no, I did. He didn't say that, um, but he just he just felt like standing in honor of such a beautiful piece. And so it's tradition when the Hallelujah Chorus. If you go to a a um, a, um, uh, a performance of Handel's Messiah, and they play the Hallelujah Chorus, it is customary for everybody to stand because of that. And just in awe and reverence of the music and the lyrics, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. By the way, seven words there, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Good to be with you today. Uh, we're, get, we're just going to talk scripture is what we're going to do today. I, uh, I just had this idea in my mind. I actually wanted to start it on Tuesday and um, was not able to. Let me just give you a little follow-up here on on some things I tweeted about my wife, I affectionately call her Sweetie Pie, but her driver's license has some name Lisa on there. I, I don't know where they got that from, okay? But anyway, um, the history is is that, um, you know, my wife um, has a condition, and I'm not going to get too graphic or anything like that. Some I'm going to be discreet. Um, but my wife has a condition and, um, just, there's some abnormalities there. All right. And, um, so it's always been a concern 
every time she has an examination. Um, a few years ago, I'd say probably, I'm going to say maybe 10 years ago, something, something like that. Um, my wife, they found a tumor. And, um, of course, they, and it was, it was pretty good size, and they said, we need to take this out. Uh, whether it's cancer or not, we need to take this out. <clears throat> and so um, she had surgery, and they removed this big knot uh, out of her, and um, it was benign, which means it is not cancer. And we were... We were rejoicing about that, <clears throat> but the doctor told my wife, they said, you know, we've, we've looked at the, the tumor and it's, it's non-cancerous. However, and I'm not sure exactly what it is they look for, but they said after doing an examination of the cell tissue, there you, you have pre-cancerous cellular condition in other words and she put it this way she said that and it was a woman doctor and she said your cells are telling us and i quote we know how to make cancer unquote and of course that's alarming lots of women die from breast cancer and she didn't want to be one of those women. I did not want her to be one of those women. <clears throat> so the doctor prescribed uh, some kind of medication. She said, you take this medication for five years. And the statistics show that with us being able to treat this now, it will greatly reduce, if you do the five-year course, it will greatly reduce your uh, possibility of ever getting cancer. And so she did. She took the medicine. She has not had to take it for probably four to five years now. But um, every six months, my wife goes back up to the... Um, her breast cancer doctor, and she gets an examination. She gets a mammogram, and um, and I made a promise to my wife um, when she first started going and when she first found out that she had a tumor. I made a promise to her that I would always be there with her um, no matter what was going on, <clears throat> no matter what else in the world was happening, um, I would be there with her. And to this day, I have not uh, broken that promise. And so last, um, last when was it? Two, not, not this other day. Um, a week ago. She had her regular appointment, and she said, are you going to go with me? I said, Lisa, I, that's my promise to you. So I went with her, and she never really knows anything, you know, after the examination, after the mammogram or anything like that. But they called her a couple days later, and they said, um, we want you to come back up here um, for an ultrasound, and we need, to, we need to take a look at this closer. So my wife let me know that, and it was scheduled, you know, for Tuesday. And um, she was nervous. I, I was nervous. Uh, we had been, you know, very prayerful. Um, we had passed it on to some other people, you know, family and so on, church people, uh, even some of the extended congregation. But it, it wasn't anything that we wanted to just, you know, come out and talk about right then because we didn't know what was going on. And so, uh, anyway, uh, true to my word, uh, we went up there uh, Tuesday. It's about an hour from our house. It's up in an area of St. Louis called Clayton, Clayton, Missouri. It's west St. Louis County. And so we went up there, 
And uh, <clears throat> we prayed and hugged and kissed. And um, they did their um, um, ultrasound. Hang on. See here. Okay. Uh-oh. I'm being told that people can uh, hear me but not see me. People can see me but not hear me. Uh, anybody who knows my cell, send me a text and let me know um, what it is that you think is going on. Anyway, I'm going to continue on. Um, so anyway, we took her up there and, um, they did an ultrasound of the particular area that, um, they were looking at. And after consulting with, uh, the doctor up there, they felt it necessary to do a biopsy and that biopsy, um, they gave her the option of having it done, uh, tomorrow, Friday. And, um, but then all the doctors and nurses in the building, they all looked at each other and they said, well, we can't do this to you on Friday. Don't you know it's sweetie pie day. And so they didn't do it Friday. They scheduled it for next Tuesday. Um, I think she has to be up there at eight 30. And, uh, now my plans for next week are to just do a full schedule next week. Um, we are going to, I'm going to do, if I am able to Tuesday, I will be here Tuesday for Pastor Mike Online, Thursday, Pastor Mike Online. Uh, Wednesday, I usually record Watchmen. I try to get a, a Bible study in uh, if I can't. Well, thank you, Jazz. Jazz is my new best friend. She said, you're perfect. Woo, yeah. Been waiting for that for years. <clears throat> but anyway, um, her biopsy is scheduled for Tuesday morning. And uh, depending on what goes on, what's happening, uh, if everything is uh, is in good shape, I will be here Tuesday with you, for you, and because of you. And um, so anyway, next week we'll try to do a full week. Uh, but anyway, um, the reason why I'm saying that is, uh, number one, um, ladies, take care of yourself. All right. Take care of yourself. Take care of your body. None of us get younger. We all get older and the older we get, the more problems will arise, can arise. And, um, I, you know, I'm like Paul, some days I want to fight on. Some days, I want to go sit in a recliner and watch a parade of angels on the streets of gold. That's what I want to do. For me to live is Christ. To die is gain. If it's more beneficial for others, I would, rem I would rather remain here. And so I have made changes uh, to myself this last year, 2016, for uh, my own benefit, but for the benefit of my wife, of my family, my grandchildren who I love. I love them more than pizza and Chinese food put together. I mean, I'm telling you, I love those grandkids. I love my church, the local congregation here. I love these people. I love our extended congregation. I love the people of Kenya. I love God and his work that he's given into my hand. So I want to be able to carry that on for everybody else in the world for as long as I possibly can. So I've made changes to myself, lost 90 pounds. Um, I am now using a little bit of hairspray on my hair, just a little dab, because I have to let it grow longer up here. My wife cuts my hair, and I have to let it grow longer so it kind of covers up the um, the prairie up here, all right? There's no trees in this area. There's just, you know, a little prairie grass, and that's it. Uh, so anyway, just, just making some changes to benefit myself. Uh, my diabetes is not the issue that it was a year ago. Um, I can even handle a uh, piece of pie, piece of cake, a little dish of ice cream, some little Christmas cookies, and some Christmas candy. Uh, you know, I can hit not too much, but I can handle some of that stuff better than I was able to. Sleep apnea, 
I used to have a real bad issue with sleep apnea, and I don't have that anymore because of losing 90 pounds. I'm not choking myself to death uh, every time I go to sleep. So anyway, ladies, take care of yourself. Get an examination. Get a regular examination. Um, you know, check into treatment methods that you think you would prefer. Not everything is for everybody. Guys, the same thing. Now, guys, they don't have a mammogram for you, all right? Thank God for that, all right? Uh, but, guys, get checked out by a doctor. You get to be 40, 50, 60 years old. Go see a medical professional that you trust. Um, get a second opinion if you want to. But if God put us on this earth, we're going to occupy until he comes. Now, I understand you could be a health person, exercise, eat every day, all these right, perfect foods, and die in a car crash. Okay, I mean, I get it. My life and your life here is determined by the Lord. He gives life and he takes it away. That decision is the Lord's and it's only the Lord's. I don't subscribe to this, this nutcase, charismatic, word, faith, witchcraft idea that God is powerless to do anything in your life except you say the right words. I don't believe that stuff. That's garbage. That's nonsense. Okay? It doesn't work. The decision to live or die belongs to God. And um, But guys, take care of yourself. Go see a doctor. Okay? Uh, some of you need maybe need to see some of a different doctor with a nice, comfortable couch and all that stuff. Anyway, let's get it. Let me check uh, some... Um, uh, let's check here. No problems here. Everything's fine. Okay. All right. I appreciate that. Everybody that has written in and, uh, let's get into the soup du jour today. Uh, take your Bible, turn to Isaiah chapter nine. This is, this is scripture day people. I mean, we're going to do it. Open up a, here we go. Got a fresh can of unopened King James right here for you. And, uh, it, by the way, I, I it it smells and tastes like milk and honey. Okay, I mean it's cool. All right. Anyway, um, we all know December twenty fifth is not Jesus' birthday. I know it. You know it. The American people know it. We know that. What is his birthday? We don't know. The Bible doesn't give us an indication in the Bible of even Jewish calendar. doesn't say now on the, on the first day of the month or the 14th day of the month or the 25th day of the month. It doesn't tell us that. What we do know is that John the Baptist was born six months before Jesus. And if I were going to, I'm going to talk a little number here. The number six has a dual meaning. One of its meanings is preparation. If you look in Genesis 6, you have, you have a dual meaning in Genesis 6. So the number 6, you have the sons of God and the daughters of men, the fusion of heaven and earth together. That theme is, you'll see it in Masonic emblems. The square and the compass represents heaven and earth fused together, joined together, opposites, light and darkness, good and bad, uh, Baal and Ashtaroth. Um, the sun god and the earth fertility goddess. That's what they represent in these mystery cults. But then you have God telling you know Noah, my, my spirit will not always strive uh, with man for that he is also flesh and yet his day shall be in 120 years. So the assumption is that God gave to Noah his plan 120 years before the flood actually occurred. And we do know for a fact that that Noah knew the exact day that the flood was going to occur because of Genesis 7, God told Noah for yet seven days, and I will destroy the earth. And sure enough, seven days later, the 17th day 
I think the Bible says of the second month, the windows of heaven opened, the fountains of the great deep broke open, and it flooded the earth. But we see God telling Noah to prepare the ark, to get it ready. If you look in um, Revelation 9, there is uh, the opening of the sixth, or no, that the opening of the sixth seal, the, the sounding of the sixth trumpet. And in that sixth trumpet, you have devils, the four angels or four spirits or whatever that are released out of the river Euphrates that was prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year or something. That's what the Bible says. But they were prepared. John the Baptist's ministry was a ministry of pre, uh, preparing or preparation. John the Baptist was to make the crooked paths straight. He was to make the rough places plain. And he was to go beforehand announcing that the day of the Lord is near. And, of course, John the Baptist was born six months before Jesus. Uh, so we don't know the day that Jesus was born. Um, but we, by tradition, we are celebrating the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some t And I've got, oh, my nose itches. I hate it. But we celebrate the advent or the coming, the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It has already happened once on the earth already. It is going to happen again. And if you think the first coming of Jesus was glorious, wait till the second coming of Jesus Christ. It is going to be far more glorious than anything that has ever happened on the earth, including the first coming. Um, Paul called it the our blessed hope and glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And his birth, so glorious, so magnificent, an event that had never taken place before. Lots of babies had been born. Lots of children had been brought into this world under mysterious circumstances, right? I mean, here's Joseph, and here's Mary. She is a maiden. She is a virgin. Joseph was going to divorce her when he found out she was going to have a baby. He was going to put her away privily, the Bible says, secretly. Then the angel of the Lord came and said, Joseph, don't do this. That child that she has, uh, we're going to read Luke 2. We're going to read Matthew 1. That child that she has, that's God's baby. Okay, That's God's child, his only begotten son. You don't have to put her away. There's no scandal here. God's not going to get you for this. You're not going to be stoned outside of the city. Okay, This is going to be glorious. And so when Jesus is born, here, in fact, let's read, um, let's read Luke chapter 2. I had to memorize. You just amazing what you know what carries through you in life. And when I was in uh, seventh grade, I believe I uh, did a um, a school Christmas program at uh, Second Baptist Church here. My good friend Pastor Waymeyer pastors there now. Uh, the late great Dr. Gene Casey was the pastor then as I was a boy and I went to Twin City Christian Academy, their Christian school, and we had a Christmas play and I was some character in the Christmas play and I had to quote Luke chapter 2 verses 1 through 21 by memory. I have not forgotten it even into this day, and it came to pass in those days. I'm not going to memorize it now for you, but it just, you know, to make sure I get it right. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And uh, this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, uh, and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And um, Joseph... Um, also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, 
being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. If I'm going to throw something in here, I'll throw this at you. Okay, you don't have to duck for this. Okay, let it hit you. God is all about timing. Even though God exists in a realm without time, time is endless in heaven. It has, uh, I, I, I couldn't even, I can't even fathom a world where everything is dictated and ruled by the passage of linear time. We cannot comprehend that. Everything that we are is based upon our understanding of time, but God exists outside of that. But when it comes to the events that happen and center around um, our world, the earth that we live in, it is governed by time, and God doesn't do anything without it being the time to do it. I mean, consider the creation of the universe. It was done. God, could God have done the entire creation process in a moment in the twinkling of an eye? Absolutely. There is not, There wasn't anything about the creation that God had to, I mean, it took him six days because, I mean, I mean, there's a pile of work here and you got to get people involved and the paperwork and the permits and got to pay bribes to government officials. No, none of that. God did it. He chose to do it in six days. Six literal evening and the morning days. That's how God did it. And he made that choice. Why? Because God is known by the things that he does. God has a modus operandi, a method of operation. And if God does, and this is what I'm teaching on Wednesday night, been teaching for a while, is that if you want something for, you want God to create something in your life. You want God to fix marital problems. You want God to fix financial problems. You want God to fix emotional problems. You want God to do this or God to do that. You want to be saved. You don't know how to do it. And you don't think you're going to last anyway. You'd like to give your life over to the Lord, but you don't think you're going to make it. And and I've talked to people like that. One of my good friends lives in um, uh, Tennessee. His mother just passed away. I've known the family for years here at Bethel. And he was so resistant one night, I don't know, it's probably been 15 years or so since I went to talk to him in his home, but he was so resistant to giving his life back over to the Lord that because he said, Mike, I failed every single time I got back in church and I am going to fail again this time. So to me, it's just, why don't I just skip going back to church and just, you know, get right into the failure part of it because that's what I'm going to do. Okay? It's kind of like the old boy that he was going through like his fourth or fifth divorce. And they were asking him, you know, after after his fifth divorce and he lost everything again. And they said, uh, are you ever going to get married again? He said, shit, no, I ain't going to get married again. He said, I think I'm going to go out every three or four years, find a woman I hate and buy her a house. Where's my buttons? Oh, see, it's all about timing. There we go. There's the other button. It'll come on here in a second or two. So anyway, it's God is all about timing. He does. <laughs> Way to go. See, it's all about timing. Even comedy is all about timing. Okay. Anyway, God does sing at a time. And it said, um, and so it was, verse 6 of Luke 2, that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Think about it, people. Here is a global event. The taxation of the citizens of the Roman Empire, mandated by Augustus the Caesar. All right? <clears throat> you don't have to ask how the man liked his salads, okay? Mandated by Caesar... Every citizen of Rome, doesn't matter what country they came from, they have to be counted. 
It was a census is what it is. And it was a census for the purpose of getting money out of the citizens of, of Rome. And everybody has to travel wherever they are, wherever they living. They have to go back to the land of their forefathers, the land of their nativity, where they are natives from. All right. They have to go back and do this. Who was it? that put it into the mind of Caesar Augustus to demand of everybody that they be taxed? Who was it that orchestrated the journey that Joseph and Mary took as they traveled from where, I think, in Galilee, and they had to go back to the the place of David because Joseph was from the tribe of Judah through the lineage of David. So was Mary. They had to go back and be at that place. And here they are traveling and God is watching over them and their journey taking days or weeks in order to accomplish this. How many, of, how many number of things can happen to two people as they're traveling you know, 100, 200 miles on on horseback. How many stops do you have to make? Uh, 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 You women that have given birth before, how many, you're riding on a horse. How many times do you have to say, honey, we got to pull over. I got to go, right? You're going to have a baby. You got a five, six, seven, eight pound sack of potatoes laying right on your bladder and you got to stop and then think of all the things that could have happened to them as they're traveling to Bethlehem but at an exact day at an exact time and at exactly the right second in the universe she brings forth her firstborn child exactly the time and the place where God wanted it to be. It's as if God could see the future. And he can. The future is as easy for God to see as the present is to you and I right now. That's how God sees it. He is absolutely amazing. All right? So he orchestrates this whole thing. And so it was, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her, not her second, not her third, not some generic son. It was her firstborn son. Firstborn. Why why did it have to be the firstborn? Because the firstborn things always belong to God. And God was showing, this is my son. Why? It's the firstborn. He's mine. He is to be given back to me, all right? The the law said that whatever it was, whether man or beast, that was the first to break open the matrix of the woman. Do you know that word's in the Bible? The matrix? You know what it is? It's the womb. Think about it. If you've seen the Matrix movies, you know that Neo has a rebirth, all right? Because he awakens, he's in this womb-shaped toilet bowl. He's as naked as the day he was born. Not a hair on his body anywhere. The plugs, the umbilical plugs come off of him. Wachowski brothers, now the Wachowski sisters. Both of the Wachowski brothers have regendered themselves. Both of them. That's like, okay? But anyway, all the umbilical cords come off, connecting him to the machine world. And they flush him and this fluid down. And he goes, you catching, he goes traveling through a tube. You know what that is? That's the womb. And he ends up splashing into this big pool of water. And he comes up, he's been reborn, okay? He came out of the matrix. That's what that's all about. Anyway, the first things always belong to God. It had to be the firstborn son. Wrapped him in swaddling clothes. I got to do this. I got to do this now. Look at, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. 
Let me, um, hang on a second. Hang on. I'm going to illustrate this. Hang on. I'll be right back. I'm not. All right. Here we go. Some friends of our ministry here brought me, of all things, hand puppets. Okay. So I've got a hand puppet here. It's a hand puppet of, in case I'm ever going to talk about the devil, I have the hand puppet, puffet, of like Puff the Magic Dragon, okay? Puff, you, you know what that song's about, don't you? It was written in the 60s, right? Okay, it's like Puff the Magic Dragon, taking a drag, okay, living by the sea, frolicked in the autumn mist. Little Jackie Paper, right? Love that dragon puff. It was the 60s and 70s. Every song was about drugs back then, all right? Anyway, so here is, here is a, a, a baby, right? Okay. In fact, we're going we're gonna to make him like babies are. Babies are never stretched out in the womb. They're rolled up like this, right? Am I right? Okay. Do you know what swaddling is? Some you guys, you're probably going. I don't know, I don't know. Okay. Swaddling has been done with babies since anybody can remember, since time itself. Mothers swaddle babies. Swaddling is not just a blanket over the top of them. Newborn babies don't like that. Newborn babies, and I, this has a point here. Newborn babies are used to being rolled up very tight, very secure. Me, to this day, I like it when my wife will come to me. And she'll see that I'm really struggling. She'll see that maybe I'm missing my dad or I'm missing my granddaughter or I'm just, I'm hurting a lot that day or whatever. And she'll come to me and she'll draw me in close to her bosom. And she'll just wrap her arms around me and hold on to me. Sometimes my daughters will do that. They'll come in and just grab dad and want some daddy loving. They want a hug, okay? Little little babies. They're used to being like this in the womb for nine months. The womb, my friends, should always be a place and a, a place for comfort and protection. The womb should never, ever be a murder scene. Never. Should never be a crime scene. So that baby is used to being snug as a bug in a rug. And mothers, now don't laugh at how I swaddle this because I don't know how to swaddle, okay? But mothers will take that baby and they'll ball him up like a ball and then they will take that. I said don't laugh. Stop it, okay? And they will take that baby and... <laughs> And they'll wrap that baby up real tight and tie that off so that that baby feels like he or she did when they were in the womb. Swaddling is comfort. It is protection. It is, watch this now, swaddling, especially a, a child with a, a blanket, swaddling will help that child retain its heat so it won't get cold. Do you know this time of year, this time of year in winter time, the weatherman will always tell you this. They'll tell you that, okay, you know, got kind of a little warm today. You know, it's January, got a little warm today, but uh, tonight all the clouds are going to roll away tonight, which is going to allow any of the heat that's 
you know, sitting close to the surface of the earth, it's going to rise up because heat rises. Why? The molecules are bouncing uh, back and forth at a higher rate. They need more room. And so heat rises. And when that blanket of clouds disappears over your area at night, there's going to be a noticeable difference in the temperature four o'clock the next morning. It's going to be 20 degrees cooler than it would have been had the clouds remained there. Now, I'm telling you all this for a reason, because this is, you're going to love this. If you've never heard that, if you've never read this, you're going to love this. Because there was a very, very important thing that we are looking for when it comes to our Savior coming to this earth and appearing once again to mankind. It is what I am looking for. I am looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I know beyond any doubt whatsoever that when he comes, behold, he cometh in a Volkswagen? No. Is he coming in an RV? No. Is he coming in the presidential limousine? No. He's coming in the clouds. That is the sign Jesus said, hereafter, ye shall see the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds. When he left the disciples in Acts chapter 1, he was standing there, and all of a sudden, a cloud came down and lifted him up and took him out of their sight. They're standing there watching Jesus going up into the heaven in a cloud. And long after he disappears, they're all still standing there like this. And the next thing they know, there's two men standing there. They were angels. And the two angels said, You men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? For this same Jesus who was taken from you shall so come again. How? In like manner as you've seen him leave. He left in a cloud. He's coming back in a cloud. And so, I mean, what I'm looking for, and I'm just going to throw in a little thing here about Mr. Antichrist. I've got it in my mind that the Antichrist is not coming in the clouds. I don't, I don't think he is. And I think God's people are going to take one look at Mr. Senor Antichrist and say, you are not Jesus. I know Jesus. I pray to Jesus every day. I read Jesus' words and study them and meditate on them every day. I know, according to the Bible, how he's coming back. And you didn't come that way. And since you didn't come that way, my Bible is not wrong. You're not Jesus. Can I get, can I get somebody to get happy about that? Okay? Uh, to me, that is, that is it. That is important. Because this world is going to look at a quote-unquote savior type individual and they're going to say, well, he must be the Messiah. He must be Yahshua HaMashuach. He must be um, um, Allah. He must, he must be the Savior, the Christ. He must be all of these gods from all these religions. He's going to be that to them. You know, we all worship the same God. We just have a different name for it. That's what everybody says, including Mr. William Graham, Billy Graham. Oh, we all worship the same God. Uh, I don't. And if you believe the Bible, you don't either. But here's my point in all this. Mary, the first thing she did with Jesus 
was take him and wrap him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Now, later on, in the same chapter, Luke 2, by the way, I, I see a rabbit. Okay, hang on. You know, um, in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then later on in John chapter 1, John says, and the Word became flesh or was made flesh. I can't remember exactly how it says it, but the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And you know, I I talk about DNA. I did another, I recorded another Watchman broadcast yesterday on DNA being a book, okay? And I'm going to work on it and get it released for you Christmas Day, okay? You're going to love it. And um, I talk about DNA. Luke chapter 2, starting with Matthew chapter 1, Luke 2 is the 46th chapter of the New Testament of the King James Bible. 46, that's the number of chromosomes. And you know what you have in Luke 2? The word DNA, the book, becoming flesh by the birth of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! I mean, isn't that neat? Okay, now watch this. That swaddling clothes thing, because I asked the Lord this one day. I said, God, why is it that you had to go out of the way, really, in the narrative about Jesus being born? I mean, surely, are there not far more important things to talk about in Jesus' life than what his mother did when he got cold? Why is it that you felt the need to mention that he's wrapped in swaddling clothes because every mother in every land that gives birth to a child, after that child's been cleaned off a little bit from the cottage cheese that's all over him, they wrap him up in swaddling clothes. Why is that in there? And then, then, to top it all off, It was like the most important thing that the angels told the the shepherds. Look at verse uh, 10. Uh, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day. For unto you this child is born. Right? For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in the manger. And it's like the shepherds were going, okay, what's the sign? Well, this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. Yeah, I know you said that. So what's the sign here? Okay, because like common sense says, every baby that's ever been born is wrapped in swaddling clothes. What's the sign? The angel said, that's the sign. He's wrapped in swaddling clothes. Why is that? Why is that so important? Why do you have to tell me that? Why is that one thing that I'm looking for? Is it like all the other babies in Bethlehem, they're just laying around naked? Why that sign? Behold, he cometh in the clouds, your Bible says. Turn to the book of Job. First time I read this, because I was looking for that very answer. God, why? Why was that one thing so important that it had to be swaddling clothes? Job chapter... 38, Job 38, verse 1, God is uh, talking to Job, and he's just kind of straightening Job's head out, because he says, uh, the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, "Who who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. When when you gird your loins, that's truth. Our loins gird about with truth. The truth is the word of God. 
Verse 4, where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. The foundations of the earth. Where, where was you and I when God did that? Who hath laid the, verse 5, who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? The measures. Longitude and latitude. A circle has 360 degrees in it. And those lines of longitude and latitude, they can't be made up. They can't be exaggerated. They cannot be... um, hidden away somewhere. You can't lie about measurements. You can't lie about longitude and latitude. Because if it's a circle, it has 360 degrees in it, and that's it. So watch this. Um, Verse 6, Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, God said, where were you when the morning stars sang together? And all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as if it had issued out of a what? A womb. You think about it. You think about it. The earth has a womb. And water sprang forth out of the earth. And then, verse 9, when I made the cloud, the garment thereof, and thick darkness, a swaddling band for it. Oh, you don't get it? The earth, the earth, Here's the earth right here. God didn't just lay the clouds on top of it. He swaddled the earth. And what did he swaddle the earth with? Clouds, he said. Clouds and thick darkness are the swaddling clothes. Are you catching this? Because what did we say? What do we know the clouds do for us at night? They hold the heat down. The heat doesn't escape, and the temperatures won't drop in January very much because the clouds are holding that heat and trapping that heat in. When the clouds are gone, when that swaddling band of clouds is gone, the heat escapes. It rises up, and that cold sets in. I love this because you know what you just learned was that Mary swaddling Jesus with the swaddling clothes. She was in a type and a foreshadow. She was showing the sign of Jesus appearing because he said he will appear in the clouds. And we just read from Job 38 that the clouds are the swaddling clothes of this earth. And you will only get that from a King James Bible. It's the only one you'll get that from. Okay? Man, it's already one o'clock. I'm not even started yet. This shall be a sign in you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men of good will. No, it doesn't say that, does it? That's a lie. I think, hang on a second. I got it. Look here, look here. I have the St. Joseph edition, the New American Bible. This is the Catholic Church Bible. I haven't looked this up since I was 17 years of age. But I can remember back then. Now watch watch it make me an idiot here. Which um which is not hard to do. 
Um, yeah, here we go. Listen to this. Listen to the St. Joseph edition, the New American Bible. Uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 14. Glory to God in the highest. Okay. Gloria in excelsis Deo. No, that's not in excelsis Deo. In excelsis. Uh, excelsis, where we get the word excellent. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, listen, this is the Catholic Bible. This is the one the Pope says you can believe. And on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. That's not that is not what the that's not what God said. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Christ died for everybody, people. God wants peace and goodwill to all mankind to all men i'm i'm burdened this year about about how we treat people especially this time of year about how we we lose it when we're standing in line at walmart and you're arguing the price with some 19 year old gal and it's not her fault. And you're just tearing her to shreds right in front of everybody. I was at a Walmart one time, and I was traveling, so I was kind of in a hurry, but I realized I left my my dress shoes at home, so I stopped at a Walmart in Rolla, Missouri. I found a pair of shoes, and I'm standing in line, and I'm in a hurry, and all I want to do is pay for the shoes and get out of there, and there's an old man standing in front of me, And he is tearing this poor young cashier to shreds. He is arguing with her. He is yelling at her. And it was because he was arguing the price that came up on her register. Now, you've got to remember, cash registers now are not what they was back in 19 and 14. They're all computerized, linked up to a database, and she scans the product code, and the computer tells her that that product is $50. Well, I don't know what this, I'm just, boy, I'm having a good time here, but I I don't know what this guy, what he was thinking, but he said, I saw that, I, that product was sitting right there, and the, the, the price tag underneath it on the shelf that it was sitting on said Forty-two ninety-five, or something like that, or it was like forty-eight ninety-five. It was like a dollar or two. The difference. That was it. And he was he was raking this poor girl over the coals. She had to call somebody in to come and help her out, and then they had to go find where this guy got this from, and they had to do some investigation, and they had to pull up a database, and they had to do all this and all that, and he's, I mean, he is yelling at this girl. Then he tries to get me involved. And I just said calmly, look, I'm not part of this. All I want to do is pay for my shoes and get back on the road. I'm I'm late. And he's going, see, you're holding this man here up. He blamed it on her. You know what he did? When they came back and they said, sir, we don't know how this box got on that shelf, but there's no other products anywhere close to that product in this shelf area. Somebody must have just laid it there, and we're telling you the price for this is $50. Slammed it down, walked away, and he said, oh, I don't want it then. If y'all going to treat people like this and treat your customers like this, I don't want anything to do with it. And I just stood there, and that poor girl, and I, I said, ma'am, I said, I just want you to know that not everybody in the world's like that. And I said, I was praying for you while this man was doing this to you, and I just want you to know that somebody that doesn't know you cares about you. She said, thank you for that. And I just, people, I just want to tell you something, okay? If you're going to say, well, I'm a Christian, I believe the King James Bible, then you live it. You don't treat people like they're trash or like they're less than you. 
And I'm going to say this too, and I'm going to I'm going to be mean about it. Now, I know that not everybody does Christmas. And I'm I'm okay with that. I am. For whatever your reason is. Maybe you don't like the commercialism of it. Maybe you just maybe you can't afford to buy everybody a gift. Maybe maybe you've heard that Oh, it's pagan, and I don't worship trees, and okay, and, and that's fine. And I don't want to defile your conscience, but I don't get on Facebook, especially in the month of December. Very rarely will I do it. It's because I see some of the meanest, most hateful, condescending arrogant, pompous, trashing, hateful, willfully vengeful comments made by people who don't do any kind of Christmas or Jesus coming, his advent, anything like that on December 25th. They have no part of it whatsoever. And they treat people like they are human garbage. Like they are animals. Like they have no feelings. Or, however they get treated, you've got it coming. Because you have Christmas and we don't. So please... Don't try to convince me how Christian you are because of the way you treat people. Because I don't believe it. Paul was right when he said, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, I I know of some people, I've encountered people in, in this ministry that they don't have any kind of December observance of the advent of Christ, and they have a meek and a mild spirit about it. And I want you to know I love you, and I think you're doing the right thing. You have your reasons. It's not for me to try to defile your conscience and try to tell you, oh, I don't think you're doing right. That is not my place to do. And you treat people with love. You're not the ones I'm talking about. The ones I'm talking about are arrogant, pompous, condescending, hateful Vicious, mean, cruel, care nothing, care nothing about the people that they're shouting at, writing in all capital letters, calling people names because they do something on December 25th or the people that they're yelling at while they don't do anything on December 25th And that makes them more saved? Does it make them more righteous? Does it make them to where they get more stuff from God that other people won't get because they open presents December 25th? Is that it? And so here's, here's my question. You didn't open presents December 25th, but you were looking at porn on the internet. So tell me, how much better are you? You didn't open presents and drink eggnog on December 24th, December 25th, December 26th. I actually had somebody tell me. I asked the question. I said, so... You're saying it's wrong for me to give gifts to my wife and children on December 25th. 
can I do it on December 24th or the 23rd or the 26th or the 27th? And they said, yeah, you just can't do it on the 25th. And they were serious, and I'm just going. If you're going to call yourself a Christian, then you act like one. You act like you've got the gifts of the Spirit, meekness, temperance. Those are the gifts of the Spirit, and they're given to people who don't deserve them. That's why they're called gifts, not wages. The gifts that you have of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, faith, meekness, temperance, those gifts that you have been given to you are the unmerited grace of Almighty God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And they were given to you not because you did something better on one day than somebody else did. They were given to you because God loved you and wanted you to have them. So, again, for those of you who do this in a meek, mild, temperate way, and if anybody asks, you say, here is why we don't do this in our home. I am all for that. But for the Facebook stuff and the YouTube videos where these people are boasting and bragging and and yelling and screaming at everybody. There was a somebody sent me an email with a YouTube video attached to it of a man. But this was videotaped by himself. He videotaped. We haven't used videotape in 20 years. He filmed film. He videoed, he recorded his street preaching yelling and screaming at moms walking at the mall with their children, screaming at them that Santa Claus is Satan and Christmas is evil and there is no Santa and you people are going to hell. And Now, some would say, well, he's telling them the truth. Um if we're going to use Bible, let's use the whole thing and say, preaching the truth in love. And there's a difference. And even lost people know the difference. So if you're going to abstain this coming weekend, by all means, abstain. Do all as unto worshiping the Lord. You observe or you don't observe, but you observe for the Lord or you don't observe for the Lord. But don't brag about how good you are and don't boast about how you are of a higher status than everybody else and how much more righteous and holy you are because I know for a fact that you're not and you're not fooling me. And I say that to you in love because I care about you and you want to live a holy life and I'm all for you doing it. But people who live a holy life, they don't have to go around telling everybody that they live a holy life. They just live their lives and what people think about them doesn't matter to them and it doesn't, it doesn't add to or take away from how they live. They just do it because they're not doing it to get everybody to notice them. They're not doing it to get everybody's get in everybody's face. They're doing it because they feel that it's right to do this and they want to do this for their Lord. And that and not not for wages and not for pay. Not in order to get something from God. They do it because they already have something from God. And this is how they want to honor the Lord. And I'm let do it. I love you. But you, you arrogant, pompous people, I have very little patience with you.
Very, very, very little. All right? Let's get back on track here. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Man, I want to have a good time here in the word of the Lord. What I'm saying to you is, let's treat people the way Jesus treated people. Let's treat sinners the way Jesus treated sinners. Let's treat people who December 25th is not their favorite time of year because they got to work the 24th up till midnight. They have to get up early on the 26th to open the store or be there when it opens to work the return line. And they're going to deal with about 5,000 people in an eight-hour shift People who are tired, people who are these um, wealthy middle-class Americans who don't have anything in the world to do except gripe and complain the day after Christmas. And these people have to deal with them, and they have to do it with a smile all day long. Treat those people right. You stand in line at Walmart or Kmart or Target or Sears or wherever it is, you're standing in line. You be sure you treat those people the way Jesus treats you. Can I get an amen out of somebody? Matthew 1, 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary espoused to Joseph, before they came together, very important, she was the virgin mother of the Son of God. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily, secretly, privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph. Thou son of David. Oh, think about that now. Son of David. Jesus, son of David. Okay, he is. Jesus was the son of David. He was of the house and lineage of David. Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Do not believe Joe Smith whose version of this is God, Jehovah, Elohim, sneaking into Mary's house about 12 o'clock one night, knocking on her door, and she comes to answer the door, and he's giving her the eye, going, hey, baby, how'd you like to have a kid? How'd you like to have my baby, baby? That is so perverted and so wicked it just disgust, it makes me angry, the Mormon church. They got it wrong. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Um, well, let's see here. I lost my place here. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now, let me tell you this, okay? Hebrew roots and sacred name people. They feel the need to go around correcting everybody on how wrong they are because they say the name Jesus. And we all know that the Bible never tells you what the name Jesus means. You've got to get it in the original Hebrew. The original Hebrew, Yahushua, or Yahshua, or Yeshua, or Yeheshua, or Yehoshua, you got to accent it right, or is it Yehushusha, something like that. It's like 50 different variations of sacred name witchcraft stuff. You got to say it right. You got to say it in original Hebrew. I mean, after all. I mean, if my Jewish friend comes to me and his name is um, Shlomo, I don't call him Solomon. I call him Shlomo because that's his name and his language. And I'm his friend and I want to honor him by saying his. See, they come up with all these reasons why they do this, except, you know, like 
anything the Bible says. But their, one of their points is, is that you cannot call Jesus Jesus. They see, I, there I did it. I called him. I called Jesus Jesus. You can't call Jesus Jesus. You have to call Jesus. I don't know. Anyway, but they say you you'll never get the meaning of what Yahushua means if you say it in that Greek pagan Roman wicked. Hey Zeus, you're you're actually calling to the god Zeus when you say hey. Zeus. That's what they that's what they accuse everybody of. And here again, these are the people who accuse everybody of being less than they are. And let me tell you something. I'm one of these that if something is in the trash can surrounded by trash, it's trash. All right? And, you know, back in the day, I watched Seinfeld, and there was this episode of George, you remember? And he found, like, a donut in the trash can, and he picked it up, and he was eating it. If it's in the trash can, it's trash. And let me tell you something. You might, because of what you say and because of what you do, you might think that you are, in fact, better than other people, Christians or church people or whatever. But trash is trash. And if we're in the trash can, we're trash. And it doesn't matter if we're on the top of the trash heap or at the bottom of the trash heap. We're trash. Okay? Anyway, what does the word Jesus mean? Well, it tells you right there in verse 21, And she shall bring forth the Son, and shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. The name Jesus doesn't matter if you say it in Hebrew or you say it in Greek, okay, which is um, Iesu. Okay, that's the Greek, um, I can't remember what part of speech it is, but anyway, Iesu. That's how, it's, that's how it's said. That's how it's spelt. Or you say it in English. Or you say it in uh, Espanol. Okay. Um, Jesus. I don't know how to say it in other languages. Okay. But it means right here, he shall save his people from their sins. The Bible just told you what it means. You don't need, to, you don't need the Hebrew definition. You don't need a dictionary. You got it right here. He shall save his people from their sins. The name Jesus, the name Joshua, the name uh, Hosea, the name Isaiah. Um, what other names? Anyway, there's like a Hebrew root, literally, a root word that refers to salvation in all these names, Isaiah, Hosea, um, Joshua. Um, I can't, there's other variations in the Old Testament in your King James. They all mean Savior. He's the Savior. Hosanna is, is based upon that. Hosa part of Hosanna is he's the Savior. All right? Now, this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted, or which being interpreted is God with us, Emmanuel. And, and here's the cool part. How many times... In Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, the whole New Testament. How many times was Jesus ever referred to by somebody as Emmanuel, other than right here? Nowhere. None of the other Gospels uh, called him Emmanuel. You don't see the, uh, the disciples walking up to Jesus. And the disciples went up to Emmanuel and they said, uh, Master Emmanuel, did, nobody called him that. Paul never referred to him that way. John didn't. Peter never said the name uh, Emmanuel that I know of. But yet his name was to be prophesied God with us. You know what I think? I think whatever was lacking in his first coming will be fulfilled at his second coming. Hallelujah. Because literally... God is going to be with us on this earth 1,000%.
thousand years. And then after that, when he finally takes Satan, throws him into Fire Lake for all of eternity, all the evil angels burn in Fire Lake, Lake of Fire, all the sinners cast into the Lake of Fire. And the city of God, New Jerusalem, comes down from heaven. God himself shall be their God, and they shall be his people, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And they will be with God, and God will be with them forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! God will be with man. Somebody say amen. This Bible's right. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Now, uh, here's what I want to do. Go through some places, uh, and for the next four and a half hours... You might want to go get you a glass of tea and some Christmas cookies and, uh, you know, just anything you want here and just sit and relax. Turn your heating pad on. I've got mine on. We're going to go through some places in the Bible. We're going to see that this is not just some afterthought of God. After he gave Israel the Ten Commandments and they blew it repeatedly, daily, sometimes multiple times a day, sometimes seven times a day, after them not being able to ever keep the commandments and them turning their back on God all the time, God didn't just go, man, I'm a failure. <laughs> I need to talk to Jesse Duplantis or Rodney Howard Brown or Kenneth Copeland and Joyce Myers about how big a failure I am. Do you know why I said that? Kenneth Copeland actually said to people, with a microphone on and a tape recorder recording it, he actually said, do you know who the biggest failure is in the Bible? Biggest failure in the Bible is God. God failed. God blew it. God lost it. God lost dominion over this earth, and you've got to give God dominion back when you speak those faith-filled words. I'm not kidding you. That's what he said to everybody. Biggest idiot I've ever heard of in my life, Kenneth Copeland and that ilk. Um... Where, why was I why was I talking about that? Anyway, let's go through the Bible and let's see. The, Jesus was not an afterthought of God. God didn't say, I, 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 quick, I, I need a plan. Um, let's see. We, the Ten Commandments. No, that didn't work. Um, uh, we need uh, somebody. Uh, Lucifer, do you want to you help us out here? And No, that's not what God said. God had a lamb. In fact, we need to look this one up, okay? God had a lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. Um, Revelation 13, 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. He's talking about the Antichrist, whose names are not written in the book of of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. This was not an afterthought of God. This was not plan B. God did not call customer support and find out how to fix this. He was not in the return line going, uh, yeah, I'm going to return uh, planet Earth. It doesn't work. Okay, and I want my money back. Okay, that's not God. God had this thing figured out from the very be before my earpiece coming out here. Before, before He created the earth, God knew what to do. Genesis three. Mm -mm -mm. Genesis three. Verse 14, Adam and Eve sinned. God already knew that's what was going to happen. It was not a mystery to him. The Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go. You know, what, you know what's being said here? The symbolism of it is, the serpent now is the lowest of all creatures, even ticks. You know, ticks, you know, like little spider-legged ticks that crawl on you and they find a piece of soft skin, they stick their little 
mouth in there and puncture your skin open and just start sucking blood. You know, they have legs and ticks walk around somewhat elevated from the ground. Not much. But snakes? Mm -mm. They don't have no legs. God took them away. And the symbolism is there's nothing more low. Think of it this way. If God is most high, the serpent is most low. But what does he want to be? Like the most high. That's some music there, okay? So he's cursed. Cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. By the way, what do we turn into? Dust. And think about it. Following Satan will result in him consuming your flesh, your body. And isn't that true? Sin, the things that we do, say, think, what's comes in, what comes out of our heart, sin allows Satan to consume us. It devours us. It devours our wealth. Sin, always. There is no free sin anywhere. It always costs something. Okay? Anyway, moving right along. And he said, Thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Verse 15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. The woman would be, you know, you, okay, it's Eve, yeah. Um, in, study, in typology language, woman is a representation of a church of some kind. It's either going to be Mystery Babylon Church or it's going to be the true church, the glorious church. And so he said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. In church, we should be at war with Satan on a daily basis. We should not be reaching out to him and say, let's partner you and I. We should not be doing that. We should be in a constant state of warfare against the most low serpent. Enmity between thee and the woman. Between thy seed, DNA, serpent seed, you sons of Belial, you child of the devil, um, you are of your father, the devil, Jesus said. The seed between the, uh, thy seed and her seed, Jesus Christ is her seed, born of the woman. Think about it. What man, and referring to on earth, was responsible for the birth of Jesus Christ? There wasn't one. She was a virgin, and she conceived. And no, God, and I'm going to use this three-letter word here. I don't like to use it, but God did not have sex with Mary. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. The Holy Ghost, I don't know, but it's now she's going to have a baby just like that. She was still a maiden. She was still espoused to Joseph. God said, Joseph, you don't have to put her away. The seed of the woman, Jesus Christ. Um, and it shall bruise thy head. May the God of heaven, Rome, Paul said in Romans 16, may the God of heaven bruise Satan under your feet shortly. And remember, I said that I had the best time earlier this week because I, I found out. You can jot this down if you want. The exact words that Jesus gave to us in the book of Matthew where um, he's teaching us how to pray. We said, when you pray, pray after this manner. Our Father, 
which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, you just let my fun, our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, I'm not sure if I'm going to hit this note, and the glory forever. I cheated. Amen. 66 words exactly in the Lord's Prayer. Woo! 66 books in your Bible, 66 words exactly in the Lord's Prayer in the book of Matthew. And then I just went, I, and I thought, I got to make a note on this. And I just went, and I just made notes of all the things that I know from the Bible that are 66 in nature. The, the decorations on the candlesticks in the tabernacle, there were 66 decorations. That candlestick represents the seven spirits of Those seven spirits of God are the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, that phrase found seven times in the King James Bible. Okay? And then, then, and this is why I brought this up. Okay? It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise thy heel. May the God of Satan bruise, may the God of heaven, may the God of heaven bruise Satan under your feet, your feet. In the anatomy of the human feet, you have two of them. You have 26 bones in your feet, but the connections, remember Paul talked about how the whole body is fitly joined together. Joints in your foot, in one foot, numbers exactly 33. So when you put them together and you have feet, you have 66 Exactly. And what that, and 10, which is the number for your toes, 10 is always a number for dominion. And what you see in that typology, in what you see in that picture is the Bible always rules. It always does. May the God of heaven bruise Satan under your feet shortly. In Revelation 12, the woman that John sees, what does she have under her feet? The moon. You know what that is? That's the lesser light that rules over the night. It is a ruler of the darkness of this world, and she has it under her feet. Shows dominion. By the way, ladies, you obviously know more about this than I do. But a cycle that follows the exact number of days of the moon cycle, the lunar cycle. Okay? Under your feet. Somebody say amen, okay? It shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel, all right? That's the promise. This child, Jesus, was a fulfillment of, they call Genesis 15 the proto-evangelion or the proto-gospel. It's like really the first recorded statement by God of the promise of the defeat of Satan his power to tempt and to deceive, that power comes through birthing of a child named Jesus Christ, named Emmanuel, God with us. You know, I didn't read, 
Um, I told you to open the Bible earlier to um, Isaiah chapter 9. I didn't, I didn't even read that. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, uh, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. The, by the way, Jesus is the Mighty God you Mormons he and you Jehovah's Witness he is the mighty God the Prince of Peace the mighty God um, wonderful counsel of the mighty God the everlasting father really Jesus is the father well Jesus said if you've seen me you've seen the father if he said, I and the Father are one. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. His, for those of you, for those of you who think that in saying Yeshua or Yahushua, however you pronounce it, that you are getting more from God or you deserve more from God or you are pleasing God more because you say it this way. Well, I say his sake name. Why don't you call him everlasting father? Why don't you call Jesus prince of peace? And you know what they say? You know what? This is so golden. You know what they say? They say, well, that's a title. That's not his name. That's not what the verse says. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and, the, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. His name. Somebody say Amen. Uh, let's look at another one here. Oh, I like this one. Listen to this one. We're looking at the birth of this Savior, the birth of the child, the, the foretelling of the promise, which is why I can't speak for everybody. What I tell you, I and my family do on December 25th, we sit down. All the children, all the grandchildren there. Papa reads the Bible. That's me. I'm the, you know, it occurred to me, I'm the patriarch. I am. I got a family of, I don't want to do the math right now, but I got a bunch of them. You know what? I, I'm like Grandpa Walton. I'm the patriarch. Okay? I'm the head of this body. And I take that serious. Man, this is cool. So we get the Bible out and Daddy reads the Bible. Daddy shares his heart about, the, the last year, what it's done for us, what it's done to us. Dad talks about people that we miss, mistakes we made, okay? Promises that we'll try to do better the next year and how important family is to us and how special to Sweetie Pie and I Every one of those children, grandchildren, those husbands of my girls, the wife of Matthew, Caleb, coming into our family. This is, this is our time. And I was told that I can't do that on December 25th. That's nuts. Okay? And then we pray. I pray for my family. Pray that God will enrich their lives, that God will draw them closer to him every day, that if necessary, God can wreck every vehicle they've got, burn their house to the ground. I don't want that to happen. But if necessary, God, you do whatever it takes to make sure that my family lives right like you did with me. That's what we do, Jack. Man, I love this story. This is why we do what we do. I love this. And this is our opportunity as a family to commemorate the one that was prophesied to Abraham, Genesis 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy, from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee. You know what our country is? It's this world. 
my father's house is the house of Milton Don Hoggard. That was my dad's name. Big Youngin, they called him. Okay? One of these days, God's going to call me out of my country, this world. He's going to call me out of my father's house, and he's going to show me that new land he's going to give me. I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. God had promised Abram a, that he would make, him, make of him a great nation, and Abram didn't have a kid, not one. No children did him and Sarah have. Genesis 13, after Lot leaves, the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward, southward, eastward, and westward. Four. Look at there. Four. You know what that is? That's he built four square that he's looking at by way of the four gospels. And he said, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. Abraham's going, I don't have any kids. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Now, this, I'm going to throw this in, have a little, little pet theory, and then move on. I think references to the dust is the Bible telling you about quantum particles. You write that down, you run with it. Let's move on. Genesis 15. After these things, the word came unto Abram in a vision. And I want you to notice that three times here, God made these promises to Abram, and Abram was not even Abraham yet. Name change in the Bible signifies transformation. It's salvation. I have a new name written. Okay? A new name written. I have it. It's granted to me by my God because of the transformation, the change that God makes in us. Because we like drug the old name through the dirt, right? Okay? So he gives us a new name. Before God ever gives Abram, Abraham, he's making these promises to him. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord. You know what, you know what the word of the Lord is, don't you? It's your Bible. Behold, the Bible came unto him, saying, The word of the Lord came unto him, saying, By the way, the word of the Lord Jesus. He's the word of God. This shall not be thine heir. Talking about Eliezer or Lot. But he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth. Look at this. Look at this. He brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars. If thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he, the Lord, counted it to him for righteousness. By the way, the seed of Abraham is the child that was born, Jesus. And God's telling Abram, look, see those stars up there? Your seed is going to be as those stars. Jesus is the bright and morning star. Jesus is the son of righteousness. And Malachi rising with healing in his wings. Jesus is the son going in his circuits as a bridegroom coming out of his closet. Jesus is the one that we seek and that we hold on to until the day dawn and the day star arise in our hearts. See, God was not making that up with Abram. God was not just saying, oh, Abram, see those stars? Now, just imagine now that your seed is going to be kind of like that. No, he said, no, your seed is going to be that. 
Jesus is the day star. Amen. Okay, the mm, the bright and morning star. We have a picture of Jesus' birth in Exodus chapter 2. It's in the form of a Savior by the name of Moses. Exodus 2, 1, there went a, uh, a man of the house of Levi and took a wife, a daughter of Levi, and she wore Levi's. Oh, come on, you thought that was funny. <laughs> she wore Levi's. The woman conceived and bare a son, and when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. Think about it. Christ in Christ dwelt the fullness of the Godhead, Father, Son, or Word, and Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Hid him three months, and when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein, and she laid in the flags by the river's brink. Of course, we're talking about Moses from the tribe of, by the way, Levi, third tribe. Leviticus, third book. Leviticus has 27 chapters, three times three times three. You know what Leviticus is? It's a foreshadowing of the new covenant. And the blood is not the blood of bulls and goats. It's the blood of the lamb, Jesus Christ, and the new covenant. Matthew through Revelation, 27 books, 3 times 3 times 3. Isn't that beautiful? Turn to Acts chapter 7. You want to talk typology? Acts chapter 7 is loaded with prophetic typology. Stephen, and you got to understand, by the time Stephen was done preaching, you, you men of God, you listen to this. You see, we hope that when we preach, us preachers, when we preach, our hope is that people respond with um, sorrow, that they respond with repentance, that they're ready to come to the altar and lay it all out if they're at the cross for Jesus Christ. We go down, put our arms around them, we pray with them, we counsel them at the altar, we give them scriptures, and obviously that's what we hope. When us preachers preach, we hope that people respond by walking the aisles. Stephen had to have known that what he was saying was going to get him killed. See, Stephen, when he preached this, he was pretty sure that whenever those men came toward him, they were not going to repent. He had them so angry and worked up at him by what he said that when he got done they never even broke stride they grabbed him through their coats on Saul's arms the apostle Paul and stoned him to death outside of the city with Stephen standing there the stones pushing his skull in blood pouring down all over his garments Literally, within 10 seconds of drawing his last breath, he said, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Just like Jesus did. And the reason why is Stephen's sermon was full of prophetic typology, and every bit of it had to do with Israel rejecting their own Savior. Acts chapter 7, verse 25, speaking of Moses as a prototype of Jesus, foreshadowing of Christ. He's the one leading the people out, taking them to the promised land. Jesus was the lawgiver, but it's a new law. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. Moses was learned, this is verse 22 of Acts chapter 7, Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds, and he was full 40 years old. See that number? Four Gospels. Full 40 years old. It came into to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Now think, when you think of this, think Jesus. 
Jesus, and by the way, when, Mo, when Moses was 40 years old, that's when it came to his mind to visit his people Israel. The beginning of the New Testament is Matthew. 40th book of your Bible, people. That's not an accident. It matches the typology of Moses, the way Stephen presented it when Moses was full 40 years old. I mean, think about it. The 930, Matthew chapter 1, because that's the, that takes you from the first Adam, the book of the generations of Adam. Adam lived 930 years and he died. Then it takes you to the 930th chapter of the Bible, which is Matthew 1, and it starts out the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. Takes you from the first Adam to the second one. And then you have like a double thing here that Matthew ends up being the 40th book of the Bible. 40th book. And the typology is Moses, 40 years old, and he had it in his mind, I think I'm going to go visit my people Israel. Man, this, this is great. When he was full 40 years old, he came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. Do you see that? Jesus came unto his own, and his own received him not. He came to them, and he was going to deliver them. And he tried to tell them that. And they didn't believe him, and they understood it not. And here is Jesus on the cross, quoting the 500th chapter of the Bible, uh, Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And they're going, uh, what did he say? I... I don't know. Sound like he's saying Elias, something about Elijah. Maybe he's wanting Elijah to come get him off the cross. Maybe Elijah should dig him off that cross. I don't know. I ain't touching him. They didn't understand, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because in that same chapter, they pierced my hands and feet. They parted my garment and cast lots for my vesture. They didn't understand it. Boy, this stuff is rich, isn't it? Mm, 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 mm. Boy, it's good. Anyway, look at verse uh, 26, Acts chapter 7. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren. Why do you wrong one to another? Verse 27, but he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? That's the same thing they did to Jesus. You're not our boss. You don't tell us what to do. Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying and was a stranger in the land of Midian where he begat two sons. By the way, Moses married what kind of wife? Was she a Jew? No. She was a Gentile. She was a non-Jewish bride. That's Jesus who takes a non-Jewish Gentile bride, which is us, the two sons represent 2,000 years of the church age, represent the two laws. Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets, represents the Old and the New Testament. That's what these two sons are. Um, let's see here. We got two sons. Verse 30, and when 40 years were expired, there appeared another 40 years. See that? Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, there appeared unto him the wilderness of Mount Sinai, an angel of the Lord, in a flame of fire in a bush. I, angel of the Lord was Jesus. I think it was, because he calls him Lord. Uh, when Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to, uh, to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Remember when Jesus referred to He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Three being a number four resurrection. Um, I'm going to uh, go a little bit over schedule today, if that's all right with you. I had to turn my music off. Uh, let's see here. In verse 33, then 
said the Lord to him, put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. Think about what I just told you about the feet. The 33 bone connections in your foot, both of them together being 66. When shoes are on your feet, the gospel, the word of the gospel, the Bible is hidden. When shoes are off of your feet, those joints, those books are revealed. All right. And, it, you know, it's just real simple to think of it that way. You take your shoes off. By the way, what customary thing was done when you came into someone's house? Wash your feet. You know what that is? The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in the furnace of earth purified seven times. Uh, let me give you another one. Um, Jesus in Ephesians 5 washes the bride, his body, the church, with water by the word of God. Bible. The Bible is what cleanses us. Um, where did I see this? Was that Charisma Magazine website? They were advertising, uh, this was this morning, they were advertising a book that they can sell you called How to Be Baptized in the Holy Ghost. Be baptized in the Holy Ghost of God. How to be baptized in the Holy Ghost of God. Okay? It's real simple. Read your Bible and believe it. And the Holy Ghost will baptize you and wash you clean with those holy words that are in it. You'll be washed with water by the word of God. Mm, mm, mm. Think about that. Think of water being a symbol of the Bible, right? Where did they find Moses? Where did uh, Pharaoh's daughter pull him from? Came right out of the water. The word of God. Uh, let's see here. Verse um, 34, I've seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt, and I've heard their groaning, and am come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same God did send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He's talking about Jesus. It's a foreshadowing of Jesus. He brought them. And see, the Sanhedrin, or the guys that are listening to Stephen, they're catching this. And the more Stephen does this, the hotter they get. Because they know that Stephen is talking to them of the typology of Moses being Jesus. They're the ones who, when Jesus came to them, or Moses, they rejected it. Okay? And that's what Stephen's doing here. Uh, verse 36, he brought them out after they had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. Jesus did signs and wonders all over the place, and they, people saw it. Verse 37, this is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. Stephen is saying, uh, you know who that prophet was? That, Moses, that your father Moses said he was going to send a prophet. You know who it was? It was Jesus. Verse 38, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel. Uh, let me just throw this in. You're going to have people saying, uh, now, the church is only uh, uh, in, in this church age. The, the, the Israel is not the church, and the church is not Israel. That is not what your Bible says. There was a church in the wilderness, and it was Israel. And I have reasons why I think they always try to make that difference and i'm not going to get into all that but anyway it plainly says this was that church in the wilderness with the angel which he spake unto him in mount sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us to whom our fathers would not 
obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us, for as uh, for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. That is your Jew to this day. That is the Hebrew Roots followers, the Ellen uh, White crowd, Seventh-day Adventists, sacred name, Sabbath keepers, you name it. They boast in their works and the God that they have is the God of their own righteousness, their own deeds. That's the God that they worship. They don't worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They don't worship the God whose name is Jesus Christ, whose righteousness we have imparted to us. They worship the God of their own works and their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have you offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of 40 years in the wilderness? Yea, you took up the tabernacle of Moloch, the star of your god Remphan, figures which you made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. By the way, a symbol of the nation of Israel to this day is the hexagram or the hexagon, and it's a hexagon that adorns the north pole of the planet Saturn, and that's what Remphan is. Same, same symbol. To this day, the Jews are worshiping Remphan. Same God. Verse 44, our fathers had the tabernacle of wilderness, uh, witness in the wilderness as he had appointed speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles whom God drave out before the face of our fathers under the days of David. Verse 40, and I'm almost done here, folks. Who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob, but Solomon built him in house. Solomon's all prototype of Jesus. He's the millennial reign Christ. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool, and what house will ye build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? And many such words that Stephen spake. And by the time, you, if you've never studied Acts chapter 7, do it with this in mind, that all of these characters that Stephen is mentioning, every one of them a foreshadowing or a type of Jesus Christ. And I think the guys hearing this, I think they knew it. Because by the time Stephen was done, they had their hands ready to choke the life out of him. They hated his guts. Because you know why? Because Stephen was saying that the typology of Israel rejecting their own God is fulfilled in you this day. Your God came to you, the lawgiver, the prophet, the angel of the Lord, the deliverer, the judge. These men, they, your Savior came to you, your Messiah came to you, and you rejected him. And my friends, I say to you this. Your Savior, your God, your Messiah, Jesus Christ, has come to you this day. Will you receive him or will you reject him? Will you be as the Jews? Will you be as Israel in rejecting your very own God in exchange for the God of your own righteousness the god of the work of your hands i am not part of the illuminati i am against the new world order i know all the conspiracy theories i don't do december 25th i don't do this i don't do that and let me tell you you worship a god made with your hands Worship a God who has imparted his own righteousness to you because you have none. 
ever will. We're having church Sunday here at Bethel. We're going to have Sunday school, and we're going to have church service. And you know what? We're going to sing songs about the birth of Jesus Christ. And we're going to worship the Lord our God on his day. And we are going to preach and teach the beauty of the birth of Jesus Christ. We're not going to act like it doesn't exist. We're not going to act like nobody else in the world is doing this. We're going to show forth the praises of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Sunday, December 25th. I invite you to join with us. Either come here or tune us in online as we worship the Savior of all mankind. His name is Jesus, and I'm proud to worship him in spirit and in truth. We'll also be coming out with a new Watchman broadcast about the book, the book of life, your DNA. Mm -mm -mm. It's good. The one that comes out, I haven't even recorded the next one. I'm telling you, it's going to be better than this one. All right? I love you. You're the reason why we do what we do here. Okay? I love you. Whatever you do this weekend, do it as unto the Lord. God will be praised. God will be glorified in your life. All right? Love you. We'll see you in a few days this Lord's Day. Pray for Sweetie Pie. Okay? She means the world to me. So you pray for her and you'll be my new best friend. All right? See ya.